Hi, I'm Matt Stein, a platform engineer with the Cloud Foundry team at Pivotal. And today I'd like to talk to you about how we enable continuous delivery with Pivotal technologies like Cloud Foundry and Spring, as well as with deep integrations with partner technologies like CloudBees, Jenkins, Enterprise. So before we get started, it's important to define exactly what continuous delivery is. I'd like to define it in terms of the overall value stream concept that we get from Lean or this idea of concept to cash. Basically, the business has an idea and there's this period of time during which we need to accomplish a number of things in an organization in order to start making profit from that idea. And so what we want to do is shrink that timeline as much as we can. Why? So that we can tighten the feedback loop associated with the idea and ultimately the software we deliver to realize that idea so that we can be more responsive to our customers and deliver increasingly more value to them and ultimately to the business. So the question is, well, how do you do that? Well, you do that by making the first task on any software effort actually to be delivery. So we take a very small skeletal piece of code and deploy that code somewhere even if it doesn't do anything. And we already have quite a lot of work on our hands to actually accomplish that task. And so once we've done that, we keep doing that every time we change anything. So we keep hanging features off this code and eventually we have something that's useful to deliver. So you can break that down into a few basic steps. So first, anytime we commit any code to our repository, that resulting body of code becomes a candidate for deployment to production. And from that body of code, we're going to build a single deployable artifact. And we deploy that same artifact in a series of pre-production environments. And we use various automated tests along the way to prove different things about the th code that we've built. And if we make it to the end, then we should have accomplished all of the automated decision making possible to prove that this body of code is actually ready to be deployed to production. In other words, it's now a business decision as to whether or not we deploy this code to production or not, not a technical one at all. So during this video we're going to demo the implementation of the beginnings of a deployment pipeline for a very basic application. So we're going to have four steps. Um, the first step is a set of very fast tests that are going to occur during every commit and we want to be able to have those be as fast as possible so that when we commit our continuous integration server is going to tell us very quickly whether or not we actually succeeded in integrating good code into the code base. We follow that up with some slower integration tests that attach the application to their backing services and prove that the app actually works in that environment as well. Next we're going to actually build that single deployable artifact and place that into a repository and finally we'll take that artifact and deploy it to a test environment on Cloud Foundry. Now obviously the pipeline should go on to include further tests after we deploy to CF followed by an option to deploy to production but this pipeline is sufficient to illustrate the types of automation that we're able to accomplish with the technology today. So we'll be working with a very basic REST JSON API that keeps track of people and their ages and all of these data are persisted into a Cassandra service that's based on Datastax Enterprise. We'll see several technologies in action that you can obtain from Pivotal, including on the application side we'll be using Spring Boot, which is our new foundation for building microservice style applications. We'll use Spring Data Cassandra to present a very basic POJO based programming model to integrate with our backend data store and we'll use Spring Cloud connectors to actually automate the discovery of the connection details from the bound Cassandra service that we have in our environment. Obviously we'll be deploying to Pivotal CF so we'll be using Cloud Foundry to actually run the application. We'll be getting our data in and out of Datastax Enterprise which is a service that's currently under development at Pivotal and then finally the CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise for Pivotal CF service which is really the star of our show. So just a little bit about the Jenkins Enterprise service. This is the result of a partnership between CloudBees and Pivotal. So Jenkins Enterprise adds on by CloudBees some enterprise support around Jenkins which of course you probably know has sort of become the de facto standard for continuous integration in a lot of enterprise environments. And it also contains a whole set of enterprise plugins that CloudBees has developed to kind of bring the product up to an, an enterprise level. 
The features of the service for Pivotal CF include integrated single sign-on with Pivotal CF for developers. So I have an account on Cloud Foundry. I also have an account on Jenkins. You're actually able to utilize the CF build packs when you run your tests so that you can prove that your code actually will run in the Cloud Foundry environment once it gets there, as well as um, some built-in orchestration around creating the necessary services around your integration test runs and then once those tests are complete tearing those services back down. On the Java side we have Maven and Gradle wrapper support so the two primary build systems that are that are in use today um, are well supported and also the CF command line client is tightly integrated as well so you don't have to worry about getting that into your build slave environments it's already there so that you can use it for your deployments and other interactions with Cloud Foundry. On the operator side through our Pivotal Operations Manager product we have a Bosch release that provisions a master slave environment and Ops Manager facilitates that and we're actually able to scale out that slave environment horizontal and there's also several more plugins that we've pre-integrated to help the integration with Cloud Foundry. A few other technologies that we're going to use throughout the demo so we'll be building things with Gradle we're going to be deploying artifacts into actually Artifactory Cloud by JFrog so we'll be using a SaaS service for that and for testing I'm going to use a couple of libraries one called Rest Assured which is very nice for testing REST APIs in Java and then Makito for mocking. So let's go ahead and see the demo in action. So we'll start out looking at the person controller in our application. This is just a standard Spring MVC REST controller that's going to give us two operations. One, we have a GET request that is going to do a find all in the person repository and that gets streamed back to us as JSON. And then we can also post um, a JSON to our application and that will hit our create method which will create a random UUID for that person, set it on the POJO and then save that to the repository. So if we go look at the person repository itself you'll see that it's just an interface and so Spring Data is actually doing the rest of giving me all of those operations that I would normally create in a boilerplate fashion anyway and so it does all of this at runtime for me based on the fact that I've asked it to do that for a person object with an ID that is a string. And it's going to do that specifically for Cassandra in this case. Well the question is then you know how do I get connected to my Cassandra database? Well I could go look at the Cassandra config that seems like a logical place to go and I see that I get this Cassandra session factory being injected into this class but where exactly does it come from? Well actually it shows up first in the cloud config class and what we see here is that cloud config extends abstract cloud config which is a class that comes to us from spring cloud connectors and what's happening here is this connection factory is actually going out to the cloud foundry environment and finding out about the Cassandra service that's actually been bound to our application and from that creating for us this Cassandra session factory bean so now let's take a look at our tests. So we have tests for our person controller and these are actually created using Rest Assured's uh, mock MVC framework which allows us to interact with our application through the endpoints that it actually presents. So instead of us calling methods directly as you can see here in list test I'm actually getting the slash people endpoint so it makes our test defined more in terms of the API that we're presenting to the web as opposed to the API that we're presenting to Java and we're also using Makito here to mock out our person repository so that we're not actually dependent on the back-end database so we can take these tests and we can run them in the IDE so I can click play here and we'll see that all of my tests are actually passing and I can also just as easily go and run those tests in the Gradle build from the command line and they should also pass there. We also have integration tests. So if we go up here to person resource integration test we'll see a couple of things. First of all, all these annotations at the top are giving us a full bootstrap 
of the Spring Boot application. So primarily we get that from Sp Spring application configuration and from integration test. We're auto wiring in our Cassandra template and we're using that in the setup method here to actually create our table in Cassandra and, and insert a single row into it. We're also using that in our teardown to truncate that table and remove all of the data. When you look at the test methods themselves, essentially they're the same code minus the mocking. So it's a really cool thing that Rest Assured gives us is the ability to write essentially the same code to test in a mock MVC environment as well as in a live web environment. But when we run these integration tests, where does the Cassandra environment actually come from? Um, I don't have Cassandra set up on uh, my laptop right now, so where would I actually be able to run these integration tests? Well for that let's go over to Jenkins. And sitting here at Jenkins what we're looking at here is the build pipeline plugin and what this is going to do is present to me all of my Jenkins jobs as build pipelines and what I want to do now is sort of walk through each of these builds that form our build pipeline Now the first one quite obviously is our commit tests so if we drill into commit tests and look at the configuration for this particular build you'll see that of course we are pulling all of the code from github we're then polling with a cron expression github every minute so obviously this is a demo so we wouldn't really want to do it every uh, minute in production then we have our gradle configuration and so what we're doing here is we're invoking the Gradle wrapper and we're asking it to run the clean task and then the test task. And then finally, we publish our JUnit test reports and kick the integration tests build next. Now, so far this isn't that different from what you're probably used to if you have used Jenkins for quite some time. So next, let's go and take a look at that integration test build and we'll start to see some interesting differences in using this with Cloud Foundry. So this configuration essentially looks the same until we get down to the build section. And so you'll notice here that we're executing a shell script and we're exporting a couple of environment variables, one of which is called required service instances. And that is specifying the service type, plan, and name for a service that we want to be created on Cloud Foundry. And then when we invoke the dot test service instances command, Jenkins is actually going to go out and provision that Cassandra service for us in the Cloud Foundry environment so that when we run Gradle W clean integration test, that service will be available for it. And it's really neat how this works. So on Cloud Foundry, when you bind your application to a service, it actually injects an environment variable into the environment for the running process called vcap underscore services. And in that environment variable, you have a JSON document that contains all of the credential and connection details for the services that you're bound to. So what this Jenkins integration is actually doing is creating those services for you and then binding you to those services and taking those service credentials and creating that vcap underscore services environment variable in this environment on your Jenkins build server so that when your application comes up Spring Cloud goes and looks for that variable it finds it and is able to bind to that service and create those connections exactly as it would when it's running on Cloud Foundry and then finally after those tests run regardless of whether they actually pass or fail Jenkins is going to tear down those services for me so this is a very nice integration I didn't have to do a lot of work to get the services that I need to run my integration tests and so now I can actually build my deployable artifact by kicking off that build so we'll go back to the build pipeline again and we'll drill down into the build artifact project and so in this project we have integration with the artifactory server and the important thing to notice here is that we're using 
the Gradle Artifactory integration pointing to this Artifactory online server and we're going to publish our artifacts into libs releases local. Most of the rest of this stuff isn't so much important for our purposes right now. We're also going to invoke a Gradle script again except in this Gradle script we're going to pass in a special switch called build version and the idea here is to get the Jenkins build number which is contained in dollar build number and actually inject it into Gradle so that it can embed that build number in the artifact name the resulting jar file that we're going to produce when we run clean assemble and so that's going to result in a jar file with the name of our project and our build number deployed into artifactory as a repository so finally we're actually going to deploy that to Cloud Foundry so we can drill down here into the demo deploy project and we'll see right off that this is a parameterized build that expects a build version and so what this allows us to do is to pull all of the build numbers from the upstream project and this will allow us if we were to go run this right now on demand we could actually choose from the available build. So if I run this groovy script that's pulling the build numbers here, you're going to see that it pulls all of the available build numbers for the upstream build artifact project. So that's quite convenient. We also have our generic artifactory integration turned on that's going to allow us to pull libraries from libs releases local and so we're using this wildcard expression here to match on Cassandra demo build artifact slash build version and deposit anything that we find there into a folder called artifacts. We're then using the mask passwords plugin so that when I log into Cloud Foundry my actual password is not displayed in the logs. So that's a, a uh, pl another Jenkins plugin that makes that um, quite simple and a little bit more secure. So finally we have this rather large shell script and don't be scared away by all of the bash. It's, it's a fairly basic set of steps here that we see. So first of all we're going to log in to Pivotal CF using the CLI. Notice it's just already there ready for us to go. So I choose my endpoint, username, password, my org and my space. I'm then going to run a few bash commands to determine the currently deployed version of the app and also what the version should be for the new private route that gets assigned to the app. So to explain this idea of private routes and then later on you see that we're going to map a public route, let's go over to the console. So here is our app currently deployed. It's called Cassandra Demo 21. So that tells us it was based on Build 21 from Jenkins. If you go down and look at the routes that are assigned to this app, you see one called Cassandra Demo 21, like you might expect. That's our private route, so we wouldn't actually hand this out to anybody because it's going to continually change. But then we also have our public route, just Cassandra Demo.cf.deepsouthcloud.com, and that is what we would hand out to users who are going to test out this particular application. So if we go back, you'll see that we're determining what that private route should be. We're then pushing the app and attaching to it that route based on the route version for the private route. We then bind the Cassandra service, we start the application, and then we map the public route. So we take Cassandra Demo build version and we map that to just Cassandra Demo. Next we scale up the new version of the application for redundancy and finally we script the zero downtime cutover. So one of the results of this script is that any user who's interacting with that public route is never actually going to see any downtime for this application. So we determine what versions out there, we scale down the old version, we unmap the public route from it, and then we delete the old version. Okay, so let's see the whole pipeline in action. So I have another interesting controller in here with a set of tests that we're going to modify. So right now this particular controller just has a touch endpoint that when we hit it says hello world. So what we're going to do since this is close to the end of the demo is we'll change this to goodbye world 
And if we run our tests, we're going to see that person controller test should still fail, uh, pass, but our touch controller tests are failing because the response doesn't match up, obviously, because we just changed it. So let's go over to touch controller and let's make our test pass and run our test again. and we see that everything looks good. So let's now run the build from the command line again just to make sure everything's okay. We know that it is, but just good practice to be in. So we see that all of our commit tests also pass as part of our build. So let's go ahead and commit. and then push to GitHub. So we've pushed our code, so now let's go and watch the build run. So you see that it's kicked off the commit test and those are running. And this will actually run fairly quickly, so I'm not going to do any more demo on that particular one. So you see our commit test have passed, they've turned green, so all of the downstream builds that have yet to run are in blue and eventually the integration tests are going to kick off. So this is going to take a little longer and I want to take a look at when I click on the console we get in a light box style we have the current, actually I need to disable auto refresh for this to work properly. We see the current console. So you see right here test service instances is taking a little bit of time to actually spin up that Cassandra service for me and when it's done the Gradle build is going to kick off. And there it goes. It's going to actually go out and now run my integration tests. So we'll close this up. We expect these to pass as well. And I'll turn the auto refresh back on so that we can see the rest of the pipeline run. Okay, so now we're going to actually build the artifact. So we'll get a jar file and that will get pushed up to Artifactory in the cloud. So now the actual deployment's running. I'm going to disable auto refresh again. Let's go in and take a look at the console while this is running. So you see that we're already uploading the app which means if I go back to my space you'll see that there's our old app that's still there and the new app is actually being started if I refresh this again so we're still not quite up and running so we see the Java build pack is running right here and so now that that's starting we should actually see okay we see that both of these are actually now running side by side and then finally you can watch and see all of the ac extra steps taking place so scaling up attaching the route and then removing scaling down and removing the other application so the net effect of that now is we go back and refresh we see just Cassandra demo 23 in place we'll go in there and check our routes and see there's our public route which means when we go over what used to say hello world is now going to say goodbye world and so there is an example for you of actually doing a full continuous delivery deployment pipeline from commit test to integration tests to building and storing an artifact or repository to finally deploying that to Cloud Foundry with very little code, very little work. Most of the heavy lifting actually be done for us by the platform. So thanks for watching and I hope you'll try out the new CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise integration with Pivotal CF very soon.